so we are live hello everyone welcome back uh, for our next talk we have now dr rachel green she started her academic career as an undergrad student majoring in chemistry from university of michigan her doctoral work was performed at harvard university where she studied rna enzymes and developed methodologies for evolving rnas in vitro Currently, she is the professor of molecular biology at John Hopkins University School of Medicine. Her research focuses on elucidating the structure and function of ribosomes in of ribosomes in bacteria, yeast, and humans. The Green Lab uses uh, biochemistry, proteomics, genetics, and ribosomal profiling experiments to understand the molecular mechanisms behind how a cell responds when protein synthesis go goes awry. In her talk today, Rachel will shed some light on how colliding ribosomes function as critical molecular sensors of broad cellular stress that trigger downstream events. So Rachel, thank you again for being with us today. And we are really happy that we could listen to you. And the stage is all yours. Thank you, Sakshi. It's really nice to be here. I was just saying to Sakshi, it's so nice that um, I'm so sad not to be there in person. And I'm so sad not to see all my friends and colleagues, but it's good to power through and to look forward to better times. So what I thought I'd do today is tell you two stories that are related, and I hope I'll get through them in a, in a, in a good manner. Um, and both of them are really start with our interests in the ribosome and our interest in the, how the ribosome detects problematic mRNAs in the cell and implements cellular programs to deal with them. And I wanna motivate this talk, so this is of course my, my pretty view of the ribosome that motivates most of what we think about, almost all of what we think about. But I wanna motivate the talk by giving you this view of a, a cell. Um, this is from Liam Holt's lab, and this is a, an EM tomography image of yeast cells. And what you can see in gray are the organelles. What you can see in yellow are these nanoparticles that they put into cells to follow viscosity. And what's shown in aqua are the ribosomes. So you can see in the cytoplasm of cells, there's a lot of ribosomes. They're present in yeast normal yeast at 23-ish micromolar, and they occupy 20% of the volume of the cell. And I hope you'll sort of think about this as I give my talk and think about the idea that, that ribosomes, in fact, are so abundant that they make a, it makes a lot of sense that they would function as a readout for cellular, general cellular distress. So for a number of years, we and others have studied ribosomes and how they elongate along messenger RNAs and eukaryotic cells. There's a capped end and a polyadenylated end of the messenger RNA. And we've all been interested in understanding how it is that a 40S subunit scans the 5' UTR, finds a start site, the large subunit joins, ribosomes elongate through the open reading frame at stop codons, they terminate, they release the polypeptide, and the ribosomes are recycled to undergo subsequent rounds of initiation. And these, these, you know, we've all been interested in the me mechanistic details of this. And what we've come to appreciate is that on average, we think that in cells, the typical mRNA is initiated at a rate that's consistent with the composition of the ORF, such that like cars on a road, ribosomes move along messenger RNAs, typically unobstructed by one another, and flow is at its best when they aren't running into each other. And that's driven by careful evolution of, of a UTR to dictate an appropriate initiation rate. And we and others have been for a number of years interested in what happens when an encoded or environmental problem occurs to the messenger RNA, such that the ribosome can't go past it, the ribosome gets stuck. And what we know is that the cell implements a whole set of specific events that we call mRNA specific quality control events, and we think probably the main purpose of these events, events is to deal with the fact that if you don't make a complete polypeptide, it's likely to be toxic and to aggregate. And so coupled with recognition of a problematic mRNA is nascent peptide degradation. In yeast for sure, and probably in mammals, it's coupled to mRNA degradation, so you don't keep translating a dysfunctional mRNA. And we know that ribosomes are precious and we need to get them back, and so there's machinery to get them back. And we think of these, if we use the car analogy, as the, the cell, you know, if you have a problem on the road, you pull off the problem and you fix the tire, you do whatever it is, so you don't cause general problems. So for a long time, we were interested in understanding how it is that a ribosome knows that a message is dysfunctional, and we wondered if it's because it's slow and it's hung up, and how does, the cell, how does the cell distinguish the average slow ribosome from those that are really slow and really need to be dealt with? And some beautiful biochemical work, primarily from Hanny Zayer's lab at Washington University, showed that in fact it was ribosome load on the message and ribosome collisions that drove these quality control responses. 
And the idea was that in fact, the lead ribosome was so slow that there were subsequent ribosomes that collided. These collisions created a new interface where an E3 ligase could bind that would ubiquitinate the ribosomal proteins and recruit all of these downstream factors to lead to these consequences. So that was a great molecular answer to how the cell knows that a particular mRNA is problematic. But I'm gonna tell you two stories today about how we think that this same collided ribosome interface leads to a collection of general stress responses. As you can imagine with the car analogy, if there's a big problem on the road that can't be dealt with by simply pulling one car off to the side, that the cell needs to implement much broader um, solutions to this sort of problem. And that's what I'm gonna tell you about today. Just to give you a molecular view of collisions, biochemistry was really what led to the initial insights into collisions and their role. Beautiful cryo-EM images came out afterwards from Manu Hegda's lab and Roland Beckman's lab, and you can see an image like that here, where you see the lead ribosome is here. It's in so-called classical state of the ribosome with a P-site tRNA and an E-site tRNA. The colliding ribosome is actually in a rotated state of the ribosome. We see that key substrates of the key E3 ligase are all found at this interface, though they've never seen the E3 ligase binding. And what I want to highlight for you is that the messenger RNA that wraps its way from one ribosome to the next, you can, you can see that it's well protected at the interface, such that an RNA's resistant disome can be used as a metric for looking at colliding ribosomes in the cell. So that's sort of where I'm coming from. I'm gonna tell you first a story from Colin Wu, a postdoc in the lab, and how some of his initial work using ribosome profiling, which I'm not gonna talk about today by and large, and some help from Boris Jinshin led to our first story. So Colin, for a number of years in my lab, has worked on developing ribosome profiling methodologies to be really robust. This was a method initially published by Jonathan Weissman's lab in 2009, and it's a beautiful method that effectively takes cells, opens them up, such that ribosomes displayed along the messenger RNA can be visualized with single nucleotide resolution by simply, being, simply using an RNA, so nonspecific RNA, to digest free messenger RNA to generate monosomes from which the, the small bit of RNA can be isolated and sequenced. The key step in all of these is how to stop translation, and I could give an entire talk on our efforts to figure this out. We think we have a great method to think about it. I'm simply going to tell you for today that when you stop translation with an elongation inhibitor, such as cyclohexamide, you can yield a very clean population of, of ribosome protected fragments that average 28 nucleotides in length. And these can be then aligned to the transcriptome and you can then do an, a detailed analysis of where ribosomes sit in the cell. And we've gone on to, and that, that's outlined here. What's shown here is a metagene analysis where all genes in the genome are lined up at start. There are a few ribosomes in the five prime UTR. They start accumulating at the start codon with three nucleotide periodicity, they're beautiful data. You can do the same sort of meta-analysis at stop codons where there are few ribosomes in the three prime ETR, where stop is slow. And this has been very, very powerful, this type of analysis. In data I'm not gonna show you, we've figured out that the elongation cycle actually can be represented as two distinct footprint sizes, 21 and 28 nucleotides in length, and that reveals a lot of information to us about ribosomes elongating in the cell, the state that they're in, and why they're in the state they're in. For today, I'm simply gonna tell you that as we were developing these methods to think about 21 MERS and 28 MERS and where ribosomes are sitting, we discovered something that we thought was unusual and interesting. And what we had done was we had exposed yeast to oxidative stress, as people had previously shown, we were able to see that oxidative stress led to activation of general stress responses in the cell, including the activation of MAP kinase signaling pathways. And we noticed in our detailed analysis of the ribosome profiling data that we had that there was a proline problem in these cells, that, that proline was clearly, proline metabolism was clearly perturbed, and the ribosomes were unusually we're accumulating a lot at proline codons, and that's shown here. This is in oxidatively stressed cells. We see a big accumulation of ribosomes at CCG proline codons. This is a metagene analysis. And you, if I had the unstressed cells here, you would see that this peak doesn't exist in the unstressed cells. And we saw behind that, we, we, we realized that even behind these leading, these ribosomes here that were stuck on proline codons, that behind them was another ribosome. Well, this little peak here is 30 nucleotides behind the lead ribosome stuck at proline. 
And we recognized that that probably was a colliding ribosome. And we began thinking about whether all that we had learned about how collisions are critical to mRNA quality control might be telling us something more general. Oh, oh. there it is. Something more general, which is how collisions, in addition to leading to a whole collection of mRNA-specific quality control events, might also be responsible in some way for general stress responses like MAP kinase signaling pathways that fed back to translation. And so that's really where we came from in thinking about this was data in yeast, ribosome profiling, and oxidative stress. What I'm going to tell you now is a broader story, and it's all going to be in mammalian cells from here on out, about how cellular stress triggers life or death sort of consequences and how we think colliding ribosomes are central to these, these stress responses. And I'm going to tell you about our efforts in two different studies to identify sensors of these collisions that lead to various outcomes, including on the one hand, when collisions are low or just beginning to accumulate generally in the cell, to a general initiation block, which happens through the phosphorylation of EIF2-alpha, a very well-known pathway for implementing translational control at the level of initiation, and also for activating translational repressors that block specific mRNAs, and that these are responses that generally lead to cellular survival, and then I'm going to tell you about how when collisions become more overwhelming, how greater numbers of collisions then are going to lead to pathways that activate apoptosis through the activation of MAP kinase signaling pathways, including P38 and JNK, and through um, a role for June in these pathways as well, and that this all leads to apoptosis. So the, the goal of the cell when it's under stress is to sense stress, and I'm going to tell you about several sensors. And I'm going to tell you about how they activate these two different branches to determine how to deal with that stress, whether to live or die, and how to do that. So those are the two stories I'm going to tell that I think are connected, and I hope you'll appreciate they're connected. The first one is about a, a, a MAP 3K called ZAC. And the second one is about what was initially thought to be a transcription factor called endothelial differentiation factor 1. So the first story is about ZAC. So I just told you in yeast that we had found that oxidative stress in yeast and in, in mammals, it turns out, leads to activation of general signaling pathways, P38 and JNK phosphorylation. And as molecular biologists, oxidative stress sounded like a very broad way to, to hurt a cell. It targets lipids, proteins, nucleic acids. How do we know what oxidative stress does to cells to activate this? So as molecular biologists and, and biochemists, we wanted something closer to, to activation. So what, what is closer? In the course of thinking about this, we spoke to a colleague downstairs, Sergi Rougeau, who studies MAP kinases in mammalian cells. And he said, you know, my favorite way to activate these pathways is with a collection of drugs that include anisomycin, cyclohexamide, and ricin. He said, does that make sense to you? And it does, because we knew from our understanding of the ribosome that these were all drugs that blocked the elongation cycle of the ribosome. So if ribosome on a typical elongation cycle takes in a tRNA in a decoding step, makes a peptide bond, and translocates, we know that cyclohexamide blocks the translocation step, anisomycin blocks peptidyl transfer, and ricin blocks all sorts of steps involving the, the, the GTPase activating center of the ribosome. So what Sergio told us essentially was that these drugs that block elongation somehow are leading to the activation of these general stress responses. And in fact, a number of years ago, Bruce Magan's lab had recognized that this had something to do with the ribosome. He called it the ribotoxic stress response, appreciating that that's how these pathways were activated, something to do with the ribosome. What it said to us is we could stop thinking about oxidative stress, which is complicated, and we could think about the ribosome. And I'm just going to put in here for the moment that Bruce Magan also had shown that UV irradiation led to the activation of the ribotoxic stress response. So I'm quickly going to show you an experiment that convinced us that it was a ribosome thing. What I'm showing you here is a Western blot looking at activation of P38 by phosphorylation. In the absence or presence of anisomycin, you can see activation of P38. We then asked if we took herringtonin, a drug that's known to bind to initiating ribosomes, and we allowed all the other ribosomes to run off. So we pre-treated with herringtonin. And we then were able to show that if you pre-treat cells with herringtonin and then treat with anisomycin, there's no longer activation of pathway, suggesting that active elongating ribosomes are activating. 
So that was just sort of the baseline. So the next thing we began to wonder, based on all the work that we had done on mRNA quality control, was is it that the cell, when you treat it with anisomycin, recognizes that all sorts of ribosomes are stuck and just sitting, and that those are a problem? Or like with mRNA quality control, is it that ribosomes colliding are the trigger? And we knew that there was a simple experiment to do to ask this question, and this had been developed by Hanny Zayer in that paper, introducing collisions. And he showed that in untreated, you know, he hypothesized and showed that in untreated cells, ribosomes on average don't collide. But if you treat cells with high doses of drug, most of the ribosomes bind the drug and arrest and don't collide. But if you treat cells with intermediate drug doses, some of the ribosomes bind the drug and others collide, and you can thereby create cells that have a high number of collisions. And by using nonspecific RNAs digestion of polysomes to look at disomes and monosomes, we are able to show a biochemical correlate of this. So if you digest these two samples with RNAs generally, you entirely, you almost entirely generate monosomal ribosomes. But if you digest um, cells treated with an intermediate dose of drug, you can see an increase in the disome peak, peak that's specific, indicating the accumulation of colliding ribosomes in the cell that are resistant to RNAs. So that was the experiment that we set up. We simply asked the question, do intermediate doses of drug maximally stimulate these pathways or do high doses optimally stimulate these pathways? We first looked at P38 and JNK phosphorylation and their activation over a concentration range of anisomycin. And you can quite clearly see that we get optimal activation at intermediate but not high doses of drug. We similarly were able to show that activation of the integrated stress response through EIF2-alpha phosphorylation was also maximally activated at intermediate but not high doses of drug. And these results were what gave us our first indication that in fact stress leading to ribosome collisions is actually upstream of these signaling pathways. It's sort of at the top. So if you study MAP kinase pathways, you'll appreciate that at the top of mass, MAP Ks are MAP 2 Ks, and at the top of them is MAP 3 Ks. And so we wondered what it might be that was at the top of this pathway. Bruce Magan had actually identified a, a particular MAP 3 K called ZAC, and we actually did a CRISPR screen, and it emerged from our CRISPR screen. And so we simply did a first, asked first, if we got rid of ZAC, do we prevent activation of this pathway? So with Sergi Rizzo's lab, we actually made a ZAC knockout line. So these are ZAC knockout lines. And you can see in wild type cells with anisomycin activation, we see phosphorylation of P38. And in the knockout cells, we no longer do, consistent with the idea that ZAC is upstream of P38. And in data I'll not show you, we also showed that ZAC was upstream of GCN2, and it's the kinase that's involved in phosphorylating EIF2-alpha under these conditions. So that was great. So what do you want to know next about a MAP kinase? What you would think about a MAP kinase next is, well, does it itself get phosphorylated? Because that's how these pathways typically work. So we did an experiment where we asked whether ZAC itself was phosphorylated at intermediate but not high doses of drug. This is data you've already seen, which is at low doses of drug, there's no P38 activation. There is at intermediate but not high doses. And we simply asked if ZAC was phosphorylated, we phosphorylated these conditions. We had to use a um, FOSTAG gel that retards the migration of phosphorylated species because we don't have a phospho-specific antibody. And you beautifully see that ZAC is indeed phosphorylated at intermediate, but not high doses of drug, meaning we could put the phosphate there, suggesting that ZAC gets phosphorylated upstream of this pathway. And again, in data that I won't show, it's upstream of this pathway as well. So as ribosome people, the next thing we wanted to know is, okay, if it's at the top, does it talk to the ribosome? Does it actually interact with the ribosome? And so we did the simple experiment, which is, you know, we treated cells with drug or not, and then we asked whether ZAC directly associates with elongating ribosomes. And those data are shown here. What we've done here is we're much like, um, um, Sammy showed us in his talk, these are ribosomes now fractionated along a sucrose gradient. These are 40s, 60s monosomes, and then ribosomes occupying mRNAs in increasing numbers. You can see untreated cells here. They're the polysomes, low dose and higher dose anisomycin. You get more ribosomes accumulating in the deep, heavy fractions. And we then used Western blots to look across the Western blots to see if ZAC associates as a function of anisomycin or associates at all with elongating ribosomes. 
And what you can see is that, in fact, ZAC very clearly associates with elongating ribosomes. However, its association does not appear to depend on treatment with these drugs. I'll actually encourage you to remember what Sammy showed you as he tried to convince us that his factors don't interact with elongating ribosomes, and they actually all were in fraction one. You can see that this really is a protein that's associating with elongating ribosomes but it's not associating with elongating ribosomes as a function of the collisions that we've induced. We know that there are some collisions even under normal conditions, but we clearly aren't inducing. So we went on to a slightly higher resolution experiment where we actually digested these polysomal fractions to isolate monosomes and RNAs resistant disomes in these different conditions. And I'm gonna show you the condition treated with intermediate doses of anisomycin. And what you can see here is the disome peak, it's tiny, and the monosome peak, and you can see there's lots of ribosomes here and not here by Western. And what you can see is if you look at phosphorylated ZAC species, that it predominantly associates with the disome and not with the monosome. It does fall off a bit. We think it's less, um, the phosphorylation decreases its affinity. But from this data, we, we take it, we, we think it's a, a, it, um, it suggests that ZAC phosphorylation does happen on the colliding ribosome and that it can go on to activate these various pathways. So we have quite a bit of other biochemical data that I'm, I'm not gonna show you today. We think it acts in cysts. We have mutations that block binding to the ribosome that abrogate activation. And I'm happy to take questions on that. In the last part of the Zach part, what I wanna tell you a little bit about is this final thing, which is we appreciated as we were developing all of this, these studies and this role for Zach that that anisomycin stress isn't a usual stress for cells. It's not something that's physiological. And we remembered at that time that Bruce Magan had shown that UV activation or UV irradiation activated the ribotoxic stress response pathway. What I'm showing you here is what most of you probably remember about the UV irradiation and what it does. And what everybody remembers is that UV irradiation damages DNA. It forms pyrimidine dimers, which leads to double-stranded breaks in the DNA, recruitment of kinases, ATR and ATM, and actually the MAC, to the activation of other MAP3Ks known as tau and TAC1 that lead to P38 activation and ultimately to apoptosis if the cell can't recover. But what I'm also telling you is that Bruce Magan had shown that UV irradiation also leads to the so-called ribotaxic stress response, which we think is a cytoplasmic pathway. What I'll tell you is that these pathways that are studied broadly and are certainly true happen over the time course of 12 to 24 hours. Whereas everything that I've shown you about ribotoxic stress response happens on the order of 10 to 15 minutes. So as we were thinking about this, we, um, we decided to in first, first just start by doing the basic experiments. And I'm not going to show you any of those. But I'm just going to tell you that, in fact, everything that we saw for nisomycin stress was true for the UV irradiation, which is treating cells leads to activation of ZAC through its phosphorylation, which leads to activation of these pathways. It looks on the surface really identical. We didn't see differences. But the question, of course, remained, which was how does UV irradiation impact ribosomes per se? And so um, if, you're think if you're looking at this and thinking about nucleic acids, you can imagine what I'm going to tell you, which is that if, if UV irradiation causes DNA damage through the formation of pyrimidine dimers, why might it not form our um, result in RNA damage through pyrimidine dimers. And in fact, UV radiation doesn't require double-stranded complexes in order to, to, to form this damage. And so that was what we set out to test. Is it possible that UV radiation causes RNA damage that leads to pyrimidine dimers forming, which leads ultimately to ribosome collisions and the activation of these exact same pathways? And so I, we did a number of experiments to, to, to show that this was the case. We did polysome profiling, which I'll show you. We did lots of ribosome profiling, which is the highest resolution experiment, and I won't show you, but it gave the right an that answer, that it was pyrimidine dimers. And we did an mRNA transfection experiment. So quickly, we did a simple experiment with polysome profiling to ask whether in the presence of UV irradiation, we generated disomes, the evidence for RNAs resistant disomes that might promote ribos that was ribosome collisions that might promote these same pathways. So you can see in untreated cells, there are very few disomes, whereas in UV treated cells, there are more disomes and more trisomes, consistent with the idea that we've activated collisions. And I can tell you that in ribosome profiling experiments, we can see that the ribosomes, in fact, are specifically stuck, in particular, on codons that contain pyrimidine dimers. And I can answer questions about that. 
I do want to tell you about one other final experiment. Actually, I'm going to go back quickly, which is you can imagine if this is your scheme that what you'd want to know is that the pathway really isn't going in this direction to activate P38 and in in this, this response. And so how do you do this experiment? You know, you could block these pathways with drugs. But in talking to another colleague down the hall, what my colleague said is he says, why don't you take an mRNA and do and damage it in vitro and then transfect it into cells? So there's no possibility that the nucleus has been damaged and is the is triggering these responses. So that's what we did. We took EGFP mRNA in a test tube that we either treated with UV light or not. We transfected it into cells and we looked at the ribotoxic stress response. Those data are shown here. This is untreated mRNA, EGFP mRNA. There's no phosphorylation of ZAC, no activation of P38 or JNK, or EIF2 alpha phosphorylation, and there's plenty of EGFP being made. By contrast, when we expose this mRNA to UV damage, to UV irradiation, we begin to see phosphorylation of ZAC, activation of P38 and JNK, and EIF2 alpha, and the lost production of EGFP because of mRNA damage. So we thought that was a very nice demonstration of the fact that this was in fact a cytoplasmic, not a nuclear response. So at the end of this project, what Colin had found was that colliding ribosomes appear to specifically recruit this MAP3K that's called ZAC that becomes phosphorylated. And we imagined that under sort of low level stress conditions that what might happen is that GCN2 is activated. And we now know from Daniel Wilson's work that GCN one is bound to the ribosome and likely the whole complex to the colliding ribosome to activate phosphorylation of EIF2 alpha, to block initiation generally, leading to the integrated stress response, which is a pathway for survival. And then when collisions get more severe and goes up on the collision meter, the ZAC alpha also is involved in possibly in a dissociated form in activating MAP2Ks, leading to MAP1Ks being activated and generally leading to apoptosis. And so this is a factor that's critical in the cell deciding how it might respond to very general translational distress in the cell. So we've been pretty excited about this story, but what I'm gonna do now is tell you in the last little while about a second story that we think is quite complementary, and we don't quite know how it overlaps, but I'm gonna tell you the data and, and ask you to think through it with me. And that's about EDF1. So this is a project done by a postdoc in the lab, Naladri Sinha, with help from an, a graduate student, a brand new graduate student, Jake, you can see he's very happy, in collaboration with Wade Harper, Eric Bennett, and Albin Ordero, a postdoc in Wade's lab, and Roland Beckman's lab, and Katrina Best, his student. So Naladri has been interested in very similar problems about how it is that ribosomes collide, and when they collide, how this leads to downstream quality control. And Naladri felt that it would be worthwhile to do an experiment to see if there were any other factors that we had been missing that might be involved in looking at collisions and processing collisions. So you've seen this before. What Naladri did is he generated collisions using either high or intermediate doses of a drug. He used emetine because it has a low off rate, and we can talk about that, but the same basic experiment. He showed that when he added low doses of emetine to mammalian cells, polysomes accumulated, compared to controls. And he showed before he began the experiment that these polysomes recruited factors that had previously been implicated in these quality control pathways, for example, ASCC3 and the E3 ligase CNF598. So it looked like things were working. He then did a big experiment. He did TMT mass spec proteomic analysis by fractionating either untreated or treated samples across sucrose gradients and collecting 11 fractions from each sample and doing mass spec on them. And then asking what factors were enriched in deep polysomes in emetine treated cells. He has very deep data sets with lots and lots of exciting new information. And I'm gonna tell you about one piece of data that emerged from them. And this just gives you an example of one fraction comparing the ratio of proteins in those deep fractions, this is fraction eight, in treated over untreated samples with significance on the y-axis. So this is a volcano plot, this is the fold enrichment, and this is the significance. We see lots and lots of things of interest that I could talk again about later. But the thing that caught his attention was this protein endothelial differentiation factor one, which was very much enriched on, on polysomes and was a very significant hit. If he quantitates this 
Oh, I should add EDF1 is known as MBF1 in yeast, and Beth Grayhack's lab had identified it as critical for preventing frame shifting on problematic mRNA sequences. So Naladri saw when he looked across sucrose gradient that in fact EDF1, there was very little of it. In fact, in the 40s, 60s, and 80s fractions, but it was very enriched in polysomes. And he makes fun of me because I like to see Westerns, but he does Westerns for me to make me happy. And you can see that in untreated cells, very little EDF1 associates, if any, whereas in intermediate doses, there's lots of EDF1 and very little in high doses, validating the mass spec. So that was exciting. So this seems to be a new factor that's recruited to colliding ribosomes, starting from a proteomic approach. There were lots of things we wanted to know. Um, of course, we'd like to know where does it bind? and what does it do? And I'm just gonna show you a few of the experiments that we've done to give you a sense for what we're, we feel very confident about. The first thing I'm gonna tell you about is where it binds. And this was a collaboration with Roland Beckman's lab and Katrina Best. They had been working on MBF1 for some time already. And so when we talked to them about EDF1, they added that to their list. And in fact, what I'm showing you here is the structure of EDF1, cryo-EM structure of EDF1 on mammalian 40S ribosomes. It's this orange bit here wrapped around helix 16. And MBF1 on yeast ribosomes wrapped around the exact same helix. So you can immediately see that these are very similar structures for MBF1 and EDF1. In both cases, we fail to see the N terminus of about 25 amino acids, and that'll probably be relevant. So we have a binding site, it's consistent, and it looks like it's near the mRNA entry channel. If we actually look in a colliding trisome, this is a structure that Roland's lab has solved on a particular mRNA in yeast. What they nicely saw was that MBF1 or EDF1 binds not in the lead ribosome, but in both of the lagging ribosomes right there in the entry channel of the lagging ribosomes, which are in a rotated state. And we imagine that that N-terminal sequence might make specific interactions to actually preferentially choose to bind the second and third, but not the first ribosome. But it looks like it's in a nice place for a protein known to prevent frame shifting. Um, if we look a little bit more closely at where MBF1 or EDF1 binds, what we can see here, this is the small subunit, and this is the mRNA channel itself that's been opened up for us. And you can see that M MBF1 actually wraps its way around the mRNA. This is shown in a little more detail here. And you can imagine that if this is a protein that prevents frame shifting, that this binding position makes a lot of sense because it might hold the mRNA in place. And these amino acids here were genetically implicated by Beth Grayhack is absolutely critical for maintaining frame. So a lot about this structure makes sense. We think of this as a headlock arrangement to prevent frame shifting, and we certainly think that's one of the things that this protein does. We wondered what else it might do. In data, I'm not gonna show you what we showed is that it's in fact upstream of ubiquitolation of small subunit proteins by ZNF598. It's those, those, those ubiquitolations are not eliminated, but they certainly are diminished. And this is consistent with work coming out of Manu Hegda's lab right at the same time. It's already been published, showing a diminishment of ubiquitolation by ZNF as a consequence of EDF1 function. The other thing that Maladri did is he wanted to take a, a general approach to ask what EDF's role might be. And what he did was he, in fact, took EDF1 knockout cells that we had generated, and he essentially performed the exact same experiment in wild type and EDF1 depleted cells. And he did a proteomics experiment to see if EDF1 is specifically responsible for recruiting any factors that are important for function. And this is another one of those crazy plots. This is a volcano plot. In this case, we're looking at the ratio of emetine treated over untreated in an EDF1 knockout versus a wild type, so a ratio of ratios. What's of interest to us are factors that show up here because these are factors that depend on EDF1 for binding to the ribosomes. You see EDF1 when it, it obviously depends on itself to be recruited to the ribosome. But the other factors that emerged as quite interesting to us were GGF2 and 4E2 as being dependent on EDF1 for binding to colliding ribosomes. These are interesting factors. Oh, I should say that Nal Audrey did pro or, uh, Western blot to make me happy. Here it is recruited in a wild type cell, but not in an EDF1 depleted cell. This is GGF2. These are factors that are nice because they're, they've previously been shown to translationally repress mRNAs through specific binding to the cap to block the normal cap binding protein from initiating to, to prevent initiation, suggesting to us that EDF1 might specifically recruit GGF2 and 4E2 to specifically repress translation of this mRNA that's making a problematic species because it's stuck. 
So that seemed to make a lot of sense and is consistent with work coming out of Jonathan Weissman's lab as well as Manu Hegda's lab. And I'm not gonna show you the data, but we used reporter assays to demonstrate in fact that this was true, that EDF1 depletion leads to downregulation of translational repression, so an increase in translation, as does GIGF4 or 4E2 depletion. So that's another function for EDF1. And then the final thing I'm gonna tell you is that, and I'll try to go quickly through this, Previous literature had suggested that EDF1 was a transcriptional co-activator for June. So EDF1, we didn't know how to put that together with this, this clear role for EDF1 in binding to the ribosome and this clear role that Beth Gray Hack had shown for EDF1 in interacting with ribosomes. But we knew that June might be connected to J and K, which we knew Colin had identified as critical in, in ZAC activation. And we knew actually that RAC1 protein, shown right here, has been previously implicated in signaling pathways that connect to June. So Nalandri first did a simple experiment and he asked whether titrating amatine in cells led to activation of, J of June through phosphorylation. And you can again see this concentration dependent activation of this factor. So it's sounding very much like a factor that's dependent on collisions in order to be activated. We know that June is involved in an auto-regulatory loop where stress leads to phosphorylation of June, which leads to transcription of June, which leads to more protein, which leads to phosphorylation, and so on. So we, in fact, did a, you know, I, I get farther and farther from the ribosome. I'm sure Marina is shaking her head. But we did an RNA-seq experiment to see what happened in the presence of collisions. And this is an RNA-seq experiment, so another volcano plot. So we were interested in what transcripts increase in cells when treated with agents that cause genome-wide collisions. And what you can see here, this is a 30-minute treatment and a 120-minute treatment. And the top transcript that is activated transcriptionally in the presence of genome-wide collisions is in fact June. It is the, the most significant and one of the most abundantly increased transcripts. So all of this is sounding true and real and connected in some way. So the final experiment that I'm gonna tell you is we simply asked, does this activation of this transcript, as well as all of these transcript, depend in any way on EDF1? And so we repeated this RNA-seq experiment in a wild type and in an EDF1 deletion line. And what you can see here is just the simple answer, which is that in wild type cells, as I told you, June transcription is increased as a function of collisions. And this increase is dramatically abrogated in these EDF1 knockout cells. Transcription doesn't go up to nearly the same extent. And that's actually true for many of those genes that are transcriptionally activated. They all show a similar pattern. So we take this to mean that somehow EDF1 binding to collisions and maybe on or off the ribosome, we don't know, ultimately leads somehow to activation of June and then to transcriptional responses in the nucleus that help the cell to respond to global collisions. So that's all the data I'm gonna show you. I'm just gonna end with some, a little cartoon to help you think about it. I wanna remind you of how I started this talk, which is that ribosomes are incredibly abundant and they could play a role in signaling based on this abundance. And we really think of them as the canary in the coal mine. There's so many of them that they're a great readout for what's going on in the cell. What I told you about is Collins data showing that at least one sensor of collisions is ZAC, leading to EIF2 alpha phosphorylation, initiation, the integrated stress response, and possibly survival, and ZAC leading to apoptosis through this other pathway. And in the second part, I've told you about EDF1 and where it binds and how it leads to sort of mRNA specific blocks to initiation and also to general transcriptional responses in the nucleus. And I don't know how to put these together. I don't know how, whether they bind together, whether they bind simultaneously, you know, I, I, we don't know. We have two different stories with very similar related outputs and we're trying to think about it in a cohesive manner. So with that, I'm gonna stop and just say that, you know, this has really been what we've been focused on for a number of years is how collisions are important, first of all, for these mRNA specific pathways, which we still continue to work on and the general stress response pathways and how all of them feed into translational capacity of the cell and overall cell fate and gene expression.
With that, again, I'm going to close. Colin is sadly leaving my lab to his own independent position at the NCI, and he's been an awesome postdoc. Boris has helped with so many projects in the lab, including this. The EDF1 project is Naladri's. It's his main project, and Jake got his start in my lab working on that project with Naladri. This is my lovely lab at one of our many Zoom meetings. You can see two students had just graduated, and they're wearing their caps. We're really appreciative of Wade Harper, Eric Bennett, and Albin's contributions to mass spec on the project, to Katrina and Roland on CryoEM, and to Sergi Rougeau and Amy Peterson on Zach. And I will stop there and maybe go out of slideshow so I can see people, or at least Sakshi. That's Amazing. it. Yeah, that's all. Thank you so much. It was a really nice talk. We have a bunch of questions. Great. Uh, the, the first one is from Panos. He says, there are canonical phenomena that cause ribosomal stalling, example, secondary structures in mRNAs. Are these also leading to collisions in ZAC recruit recruitment? If not, how do they evade this quality control? Yeah, I have to say, you know, my, my thoughts have evolved on this over the years. Like, what, what really are the substrates for these pathways, right? And the ribosome is a great helicase. It, you know, it, I, I don't think S3 and S4 are the helicase. I think the ribosome is the helicase. It drives through structure. And I, I think there are going to be isolated examples where structure could cause a ribosome collision, and that could result in gene regulation. But I think on average, these pathways are for things like premature polydentylation, which is a problem. And I think for, for, for damage, mRNA damage is going to be oxidative damage, UV damage. There's lots of damage to the cell. So I think those are the main problems. But I think always the challenge for the cell is in deciding how big the problem is. And I think that'll be different for different cell types. It'll depend on how much quality control factors there are, how much is expressed. And those are, those are certainly areas we're interested in, in thinking about. So it's a great question. Thank you. Uh, the next question is from Debujit. He says, has anyone seen co-localization of ribosomes with ROS markers upon inducing oxidative stress? Is it possible to check colliding ribosomes with high resolution imaging on ANS treatment? Um, I don't know about ROS markers. Um, what I... What I can tell you we've done is, and I'm sure other people are doing, so we have a paper in bioarchives now where we've taken a poly A sequence and put it into one of these SunTag reporters and worked with our colleague, Bin Wu from um, Rob Singer's lab. And we've been able to actually watch the kinetics of ribosome clearing from problematic mRNAs in real time. Um, I suspect ROS, you know, UV damage, you know, there's gonna be a lot of things happening in the cell and that's why I like anisomycin so much. I think with anisomycin to see it by microscope, there's gonna be a lot of collisions. So it might be overwhelming. So the best we've done is this sun tag. Mm -hmm. The next question is by Sarada. She says, uh, and whether under stress, we would always expect to observe high di disome peak. Um, we... Sorry. Yeah, nothing. I was just reframing the question. Yeah. You know, I think I, I certainly don't want to suggest that the ribosome is the only thing in the cell that reports on cellular happiness. I think I think that image suggests there's a lot of ribosomes and it's a good thing. It's 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 a it, it's possible that it could do a lot. Um, in our paper that we published on Zach, we show that amino acid starvation could lead to collision, definitely leads to collisions, though on in general. The integrated stress response is activated more quickly. And so you don't get as many collisions as you would think because you've activated blocks in initiation. And we, we prevented that by adding this drug ISRIB to block that integrated stress response. Um, I think anything that damages an mRNA is going to lead to this activation. Um, you know, osmotic stress activates P38s in yeast through the HOG1 pathway. And I have no idea if that's ribosomes. You know, we, we don't know you know, how many things are going to do it. There's all sorts of interesting things in neurons that, you know, DHPG stimulating neurons we think might lead to collisions. I think it's going to be general, but it's certainly not all things. If that's helpful. I don't know if that was helpful. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, the next question is again from her. She says, if cyclohexamide is blocking elongation, then how do you make sure it doesn't cause a bias in riboseq? Um... So when one uses cycle, so, you know, I skipped that part. I, I sadly this morning deleted that part of my talk. I, I would say 
we never, when we do riboseq, put the drugs into cells for this, ex you know, it turns out for this exact reason. If you put elongation inhibitors into cells, you have induced all of this. You know, the cell is in a crisis responding to elongation inhibitors and activating all these pathways. And I think that's a big part of what went wrong in early studies. So when we do ribosome pro, I have to open my door. One sec. I told you that might happen. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry. Brave new world. Um, we never put drugs into cells to do ribosome profiling. We always use it in the lysate. And it is absolutely critical when doing riboseq to, to be very careful about that moment between when you stop your cells from being cells and you get them into frozen state. I'm very happy to talk with people about that, but it's we've spent a lot of time on that step. Mm -hmm. um, the last question is from Gonzalo. He says, if PZAC alpha released from disomes by is PZAC alpha released from disomes by a third ribosome collision to the disome? Huh. We, we certainly don't know that. Um, we do see phosphorylated ZAC preferentially on the disome. We don't see much trisome in our experiment, um, probably for just biochemistry reasons. We see it falling off, and Simon Becker Jensen had a paper on ZAC this summer, and he argued that that phosphorylation actually caused the loss of affinity for ribosomes. So I think it's possible these MAP2K pathways are, are triggered by off the ribosome that it starts on the ribosome and that the, the role for ZAC and GCN2 is an on the ribosome function because it doesn't depend on the kinase active site. So there's more data there. There's more in the paper if you want to look at it. Mm -hmm. And with this, I would like to thank Rachel once again. Thank you so much. It was lovely having you on board and we are really happy that you could join us even in this virtual format. So thank, thank you, you so much. much. And yeah, and for our audience, like uh, we will start with our next talk at 5 p.m. With Claire. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye.